North Pole and Vice Admiral Richard E. Byrd's accounts. Rear Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd Jr. was an American naval officer who specialized in feats of exploration. He was a recipient of the Medal of Honor, the highest honor for valor given by the United States, and was a pioneering American aviator, polar explorer, and organizer of polar logistics. On May 9, 1926, Admiral Byrd took off from the Norwegian Arctic island of Spitzenberg along with his pilot, Floyd Bennett, in an attempt to be the first to fly to the North Pole. About 16 hours later, the pair returned to the island in their Fokker trimotor airplane, the Josephine Ford, saying that they had indeed accomplished the feat. Byrd submitted his navigational records to the U.S. Navy and a committee of the National Geographic Society, one of his sponsors, who confirmed the accomplishment according to the Ohio State University Libraries. Byrd was hailed as a hero and given the Medal of Honor. However, for some unknown reason, Admiral Byrd's official accounts of his journey were not long after disproved and even denied as inconclusive. When you learn of what Admiral Byrd claims to have found and experienced on his Arctic North Polar journey, it becomes clear why the official channels of society may have quickly decided to dismiss his claims. However, we must take into consideration the fact that Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd was a well-respected member of society and highly decorated member of the U.S. Navy. The following is a reading of the official transcripts of Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd's flight logs recording during and shortly after his pioneering journey deep into the unknown regions of the Arctic North Pole on the 19th of February, 1947. 0600 hours. All preparations are complete for our flight northward and we are airborne with full fuel tanks at 06100 hours. 0620 hours. Fuel mixture on starboard engine seems too rich. Adjustment made in Pratt Whitney's are running smoothly. 0730 hours. Radio check with base camp. All is well and radio reception is normal. 0740 hours. Note slight oil leak in starboard engine. Oil pressure indicator seems normal, however. 0800 hours. Slight turbulence noted from easterly direction at an altitude of 2,321 feet. Correction to 1,700 feet. No further turbulence, but tailwind increases. Slight adjustment in throttle controls. Aircraft performing very well now. 0815 hours. Radio check with base camp. Situation normal. 0830 hours. Turbulence encountered again. Increase altitude to 2,900 feet. Smooth flight conditions again. 0910 hours. Vast ice and snow below. Note coloration of a yellowish nature and disperse in a linear pattern. Altering course for better examination of this color pattern below. Note reddish or purple color also. Circle this area two full turns and return to assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp and relay information concerning colorations in the ice and snow below. 0910 hours. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there is no indication of icing. 0915 hours. In the distance is what appears to be mountains. 0949 hours. 29 minutes elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. They are mountains and are consisting of a small range that I have never seen before. 0955 hours. Altitude change to 2,950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 1000 hours. We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 1005 hours. I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of knit grass. The light here seems different. 
I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yet there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,000 feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 1030 hours. Encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempting to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. 1130 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God! Off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are dish-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It's a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 1135 hours. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what is perhaps a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 1140 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 1145 hours. I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. End log. From this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination it would seem all but madness if it had not happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us toward the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of a crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design board of Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage, which tasted like nothing I have ever savored before. It is delicious. After about ten minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radio man behind and we walk a short distance and enter into what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments. The machine stops and the door lifts suddenly upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by a rose-colored light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. The great door slides noiselessly open and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral. You are to have an audience with the Master. I step inside and my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. Then I begin to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of an entire existence. It is in fact too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. 
I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world, I half gasped under my breath. Yes, the master replies with a smile, you are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of Earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is of course past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely, that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted, but what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments he replied, Your race has reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded, and the master continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility, and our flugelrads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now, I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled, and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answer. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the master, the dark ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall, but I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help you revive your culture and your race. Perhaps by then you will have learned the futility of war and its strife, and after that time certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. With these closing words our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality, and for some strange reason I bowed slightly, either out of respect or humility, I do not know which. Suddenly, I was again aware that the two beautiful hosts who had brought me here were again at my side. This way, Admiral, mentioned one. I turned once more before leaving and looked back toward the master. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate and ancient face. Farewell, my son, he spoke. Then he gestured with a lovely slender hand a motion of peace and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly, we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator. The door slid silently downward, and we were once again going upward. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the Master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable, and you must return with his message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief, and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, It is all right, Howie. It is all right. The two beings motioned us toward the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. 
The engines were idling and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance guiding us on our return way. I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. Entry flight log continues. 0 hours. A radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. Off we to Zen. We watched for a moment as the flugelrads disappeared into the pale blue sky. The aircraft suddenly fell as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man has his thoughts. 0 to 20 hours. We are again over the vast areas of ice and snow, approximately 27 minutes from base camp. We radio them, they respond. We report all conditions normal, normal. Base camp expresses relief at our reestablished contact. Zero three hundred hours. We land smoothly at base camp. I have a mission. End log entries. March 11th, 1947. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours. Six hours, 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. December 30th, 1956. Final entry. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight of the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here for all to one day read. These last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. I now make my final entry in this singular diary. In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept this matter secret as directed all these years. It has been completely against my values of moral right. Now I seem to sense the long night coming on and this secret will not die with me, but as all truth shall, it will triumph and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth and it has quickened my spirit and has set me free. I have done my duty towards the monstrous military industrial complex. Now, the long night begins to approach, but there shall be no end. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in its light. For I have seen that land beyond the pole, that center of the great unknown. Admiral Richard E. Byrd, United States Navy, December 24, 1956.